How often do you think about the Roman Empire? <laughs> That's the next question. All day, every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Luke came here today. Um, let me see where I can start. So you were a SpaceX intern. You can tell us a bit more about this, but you were a SpaceX, SpaceX intern. And during that period, you found out about this super cool challenge organized by Net Freedom, uh, which is this Vesuvius challenge where the idea is to basically decipher the letters, the Greek letters from these like scorched, like car carbonized skulls that were found in Herculaneum, if that's how you pronounce the, this small city close to Vesuvius uh, volcano. And so Luke basically made a breakthrough uh, in, in that challenge um, by working on it basically part time, I think, while, while working at, at, at SpaceX, like in the, in the evenings and like weekends. So it kind of also vibes with how I was working while I, I worked at Microsoft. I always got these open source projects that I was working on like in my, in my free time. And I think that's the best way to learn. And yeah, I think without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. I think people will be super inspired with, with, with your story because I guess some people are just like have similar ambitions and and so yeah. Thanks for being yeah, here. Awesome. Of course, thank you for having me. Uh yeah, I'm Luke, super excited to be here. Let me share my screen again. Uh but overall, yeah, I'm a 21 year old from Lincoln, Nebraska, uh born and raised in Lincoln. Um, currently I'm an undergrad at the University of Nebraska. Always been into like programming, you know, various projects, some internships and the like. Um did some machine learning projects before this, nothing too crazy or fancy, uh, you know, nothing compared to like the modern machine learning projects of today, but uh, it was enough to kind of get my feet wet. Uh, the Vesuvius Challenge was launched in March of this year. I heard about it on a podcast, Warcash's podcast, if you guys have heard of him. Uh, and, you know, I've always kind of been a, a person who respected Nat for a long time. So, you know, I turned that on just because it's Nat on the podcast and they kind of explained the challenge and I'm like, holy cow, I got to do this. Uh, there wasn't any really like one thing that I'll, I'll explain what the challenge is in a second. Uh, but there there wasn't really any one single thing that drew me into it. I just kind of knew like, holy cow, like all of this is really cool. Like the prize, the historical impact, all of it. So I just kind of immediately knew it was something worth doing uh, at the time. Uh, like you mentioned, I was an intern at SpaceX. Uh, I was working on the Starship Launchpad software team down in Boca Chica, Texas. So right down at, at Starbase is what they call it. Um, and then, you know, there's a super long commute in and out of there just because it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. So I was just kind of listening to this podcast on my commute and I was just like, holy cow, I got to do this. Um, and yeah, I kind of worked on it evenings and weekends from March till July. And then July onward, I've technically been back in school, but you know, school I think is often kind of straightforward, uh, at least you just kind of get passing grades. Uh, so, so I've been basically full time on this challenge uh, since since July. So, what 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 is this challenge? Well, I'm going to start by talking about a little bit of history. So, 2,000 years ago, Pompeii happened. The volcano went off. Uh, uh, you know, lava and ash and mud were spilled everywhere. A lot of people died. It was really not fun. Next to Pompeii, there was a library, and that library was in a town called Herculaneum, which was kind of the like rich, li uh, rich like suburb of Pompeii almost. Um, but this library and the mansion around it were owned by Julius Caesar's father-in-law. We're pretty certain. And just like everything else, the library was like burnt, and it was like covered in like ashes and mud and lava. And because it was burnt and the scrolls inside of it were burnt, everything was preserved. So usually the like books and the like scrolls and everything from that long ago, uh, you know, they decay over time, like the same way how paper decays. Uh, but these were preserved because they were burnt and then they were buried. So you can see three pictures of these scrolls on the right here. And, you know, it's just this like super charred, super messed up um, roll of burnt up paper or papyrus is what it's called. And people have been digging these up from this library for hundreds of years, and they have no idea how to read them. There have been attempts, like many different kind of methods. Nothing really works that well, uh, which is not good. And they've kind of destroyed a lot of them in the process. But there's something like 400 of these scrolls that haven't yet been opened. Again, it was a big library. Julius Caesar's father-in-law was very wealthy. Um, 
And uh, yeah, these have just kind of been sitting in these museums and people have been saying, if we can read them, that'd be great. Because these are entirely new works from the Roman Empire. And that kind of led to the Vesuvius challenge. So the real hero of this story is a guy named Dr. Brent Seals. He's a professor at the University of Kentucky. And like 20 years ago, he had this idea of using CT scanning on these scrolls uh, to read them. So you can CT scan them, look at the inside and so on. He'd been working on that idea for a while. He did a lot of prior research to kind of show that it was possible, all these things. Um, and then in 2019, he finally was able to get some super high resolution scans. Uh, why did it take 20 years? Well, first of all, uh, the logistics of it are really challenging. Like he's an American, he's convincing someone from an Italian museum to take their priceless artifact to a scanner in Britain. Like that's really hard to uh, arrange, you know? Um, the AI wasn't quite there. There's an AI component to this, which I'll talk about. Um, and then, you know, just logistics are very challenging. Uh, and then the scans are also super high resolution. So the scans I'm gonna show you today are all at four mic, uh, sorry, they're all at eight micron resolution, very high resolution. And because of that, they had to scan them at a particle accelerator, the diamond light source in, uh, in Great Britain, which I think is really cool. But uh, yeah, so he got these scans, you know, he's always kind of been talking about and advertising his work. And then Nat Friedman found out about it and he worked with Nat Friedman to kind of open source the data and to create a competition to kind of find writing in these scrolls. And that's the Vesuvius challenge. So this is the website, it's worldprize.org. You can go there right now. Um, they've got a pretty good overview. Uh, so like here's like what Julius Caesar's father-in-law's mansion kind of looked like. Uh, this is what the actual scroll that I'm reading looks like. So the writing that I found is all in here. Th these are fragments of scrolls. This is what it looks like when you get a best case scenario attempted on rolling it. It's really not good. Um, if we can do it non-invasively just by scanning it, that's way better. Um, here's like an earlier scroll that Dr. Seals had kind of unwrapped. This one's a little different though. Um, here, here they are at the particle accelerator about to uh, scan it. Here you can kind of see a tiny little piece of, of scroll there. Um, I think they're just scanning a small sample here. Um, but yeah, then the general idea is you can take this scan and use machine learning uh, to read the writing in it. Uh, more cool pictures, uh, people who worked on it. But the kind of breakthrough here is um, this, the first word that was discovered uh, by me, you can see the word here. So you can see kind of the scroll, which again, I'll go into more detail about. You can see the outputs here, the kind of black shapes, which are kind of detecting ink. Uh, and then a bunch of like Greek scholars kind of verify that this word is uh, prophorus is what it is, which is the word purple. And I'm very glad that the first word we found is not in or the or and or of or the, uh, just because you know those all, those would all be boring. But these, my friends, uh, is is the word purple, which is way more interesting in my opinion. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the data itself. So I mentioned it's a, it's a super high. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, like the the. The slide you just showed there, like, is the what? What did your machine learning algorithm do? Like, I guess the OCR was not what you've done. Like, you you you, you kind of amplified those letters, or what was the how how did what was the input to your algorithm? I guess, and what was the output? I'm trying to see whether you just amplified the letters and then dis discern them, or you also done the OCR and all of that. Yeah, totally. So there's there's no OCR here. It's just bringing this ink, this black stuff, and making it visible. My job is to just take the ink and make it visible. And then once you can do that, there are these Greek scholars who have been looking at these things their whole lives and they can kind of um, fill in the blanks as well because a lot of the ink was burned off. So there's a high risk of hallucination if you try to fill in the blanks and all these things. So here, I can just kind of show you what my machine learning model looks like. Um, but uh, yeah, this is kind of the super polished output. This is maybe more what the machine learning outputs look like. This is kind of less clear, but it's very noisy and you can just kind of see the writing uh, coming into view. So the process to go from, you know, the CT scan to this is a little involved. So I can just show you a little bit of that. Um, they've kind of uploaded all the data online. You can download it yourself as well. Uh, but basically there's these tens of thousands of individual layers of the CT scan. 
and I can just show you what one looks like here on uh, on the left here. This is something else. This is kind of a slice of the CT scan. So you can kind of see this super messed up spiral here where, you know, it just kind of follows around in this rough spiral, but the papyrus, the paper, it flays apart, it sticks together, it does all these really messy things. So the first thing you have to do if you want to kind of read this is you have to kind of virtually unroll it. And the way they do that right now is you click, 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 you manually annotate this spiral and work your way all the way around, which is um, um, a very tedious process. There are tools to speed it up. There are plans to make it automatic, but it's a lot less trivial than it might sound initially. Um, but yeah, the first thing you have to do is you kind of have to virtually unroll this. And once you've done that, you get a piece that looks maybe a bit more like this. So again, it's flat, but it's still a mess. There's no text, which is obviously visible here. If we zoom in a little bit, you can see all these really weird patterns. Um, you can kind of see this like flakiness down here. Um, there's these like white specks everywhere, which I think they're just noise. Um, all this fun stuff. So you see this, you look at it virtually unwrapped and you're like, wow, there's going to be no way to easily read this thing, right? Like if you virtually unroll like a piece of paper, you can just read it because the ink is there. But here, we're pretty sure the ink is there because, you know, it's, it's, it's a book. It didn't vanish. Um, but we can't see it with the naked eye. So a lot of the time and the challenge was spent trying to identify how can we pull the writing out of here. And there was kind of one big breakthrough that really kind of set me off and was like firing the starting gun. And that breakthrough was made by another contestant. His name is Casey Hanmer. Uh, he's a very busy, very cool person. But he just kind of posted this image on Twitter one day. And if you look really closely here, you can actually see the Greek letter pi. So Casey found this and he wasn't sure if he had actually found the right pattern. He just kind of posted it online because, again, it's a pretty collaborative competition. They've done a good job organizing it. I'm just gonna post it online. It's like, hey, like, what, what, do you, what do you guys think? But if you look really closely, you can see how this goes up, right, and down. Here's a better image of it. You can kind of see uh, the letter pi isolated here. And I saw this and I was like, holy cow, like there actually is a way to detect a writing in here. And I saw this, I kind of tried to verify it. At first I was in denial, but then I tried to find these patterns in other places and it pretty consistently appeared in the shape of Greek letters, like pi's, iotas, deltas, and so on. So I was like, all right, so if I've got all these examples where I can, you know, kind of visualize the, or I can kind of see the letter visually, but only 1% of the expected letters like appear this way. Like I looked through all the pieces of flat and papyrus and maybe 10 letters I could discern using this. But I was like, hey, you know, that's, that's a start. So I took those kind of 10 letters I'd found scattered about and made a training set. So let me uh, show you some images here. Just a quick question here. Like the letters you found, you, you said you were manually basically inspecting and like, what, was that how you done it or to create that initial data set? Yeah, to create the initial data set, I was just looking at stuff in preview, like the Apple preview like this just like trying to decide and then like kind of cropping things and like, okay, like this seems reasonable and all these things, but it was a lot of trial and error. It took a very long time to find those 10 letters. Um, it was very tedious and grueling, but once I'd found all of them, I kind of had this training set like this. So on the left, you can kind of see the left side of a tau and on the right side, you can kind of see a piece of an alpha. And then on the right, you know, these are kind of my training like labels, right? And it's not perfect, but it's good enough. And I don't actually look at a like piece of the scroll that's this big. I look at like very small pieces that are like 100 pixels by 100 pixels. And this is maybe 500 pixels wide. Um, so that way, A, it is just faster to train because the model is smaller and your inputs are smaller. But it's also great because you can avoid overfitting in some ways because the model never sees what a whole letter looks like. So they can just kind of... Um, it doesn't memorize letter shapes. It just memorize what looks like ink and what doesn't. Because again, hallucinating letters is is always very scary. So you train a model on this. Um, just a, let me... just, I have to interrupt you for a second. Just we have a question for memory, if that's fine. By the way, I don't know if yeah. you hear the notifications when people raise the hand. If not, I'll, I'll unfortunately oh. have to interrupt okay. you like this. Amrit, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, look, so as, as I understand, you basically manually created this data set of segmentation. Is it mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. Yeah. And yeah, just like 10 segmentations, input and outputs. Uh, yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's basically a training set that looks like that image there. Um, and it's not strictly segmentation. Instead, I did classification where I look at very small sections of the image. Um, and then just yes, no, and then you just kind of classify each section of the image. Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the core idea is you have this training set of like these letters and like maybe 10 others, um, and then you train a model based on that. That's, that's cool, really cool, man. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I kind of trained a model. The model is very simple. It's just a ResNet 18. Um, you know, ResNet is just kind of the off the shelf image classifier that's easiest to use. And um, uh, what's great about it is just like super quick to get up and running. You just kind of train it on these. You start with the like one that's pre-trained on ImageNet or whatever, and then train it on these. Um, and then once you have that, you can try it on different places of the scroll and more letters can appear because you know the machine learning can pick up on patterns that you yourself missed or the patterns were too faint for you to otherwise distinguish. Um, but the, the threshold for this kind of first letters prize that this page talks about is 10 letters right next to each other. And I had 10 letters scattered about, but not 10 letters next to each other. And for a long time, the bottleneck was just how fast can you flatten the scroll? How fast can you undo the spiral and get flattened pieces to try your algorithm on? And eventually, um, someone uploaded a, a flattened piece, and I ran this on that. And uh, this text appeared, and I was just shocked, like, holy cow, like, this might actually work. Like, you can see this writing um, very faintly, but it's there. And I kind of looked at the data again, and it's like, yeah, I'm not sure I would have um, not sure I would have caught that if I was inspecting it visually, which I thought was cool. So I kind of see this, and I'm like, wow, we're close to 10 letters next to each other, but we're not quite at 10 letters. And I spent a lot of time just kind of bootstrapping. Like you take these letters I detected, you take other letters I've detected kind of individually, and you can add them to your training set, right? And then you can retrain the model with your larger training set, and then you can kind of bootstrap your model that way. Um, and then I was able to kind of um, improve it from this uh, up into this, which looks a bit better in my opinion. You know, these letters are far more visible. Um, these boxes don't mean anything. Uh, they're just uh, annotations from other people. Um, here's a better image, yeah. All right, so this image looks much, clean, much cleaner than the image before. One question for yep. me, Uh-huh. How big was final uh, bootstrap data set? Um, sorry, say that again? You bootstrapped data set, like uh, you trained model, it detected uh, symbols. You used the symbols to train uh, like m more, uh, like better model uh, that uh, like you started with 10 symbols. Uh, how many symbols did you have in final uh, like uh, submission? Um, so in the final submission for this first letters thing, I had maybe uh, 15 letters. Um, I don't know the exact count. Uh, but it's not that many like it was 10 to 15 and that was enough of an improvement to kind of get this uh i actually have sorry go ahead so you trained like a uh, whole final model was trained on 15 letters yes yes yeah that's but, crazy yeah it's it's a very small data set but it's a very small network um and again the letters are chopped up into smaller bits and then those smaller bits are fed into the model so, so you're not just showing how many of smaller bits do you have then, I guess, is the question. Um, so the window that the model looks at is like 100 by 100. Um, and then the individual letters are like 500 by 500 pixels. So, you know, it's in the like tens of thousands of training examples that you have um, just from like augmentations and stuff too. Uh, so you have plenty of examples. Even then you still have some overfitting problems. But uh, yeah, ch like chopping it up into smaller bits, I think really helps. Nice. And while we are here, I have a, one more question. Are you familiar with DeepMind's work called Ithaca? Uh, Ithaca, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but I've heard about it. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I don't know a lot. I just know that it's kind of related in the sense they they were trying to reconstruct uh, ancient texts where like yeah. some pieces are missing, and so maybe like an idea I had I had at talk where you were like telling us more about this is just like combining somehow those two lines of research and potentially reaching out to deep mind researchers, which I can connect you with. If, if you yeah, wish. Cool. Um, because that definitely seems something that they would be interested in, and it looks like they've been working on similar stuff as well. So, like, just mm -hmm. that way. Yeah, that sounds super cool. Yeah, I'm super down. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, you kind of take this image, you show it to these like Greek scholars, and then they kind of read it. I like tried to identify letters in here. So, you know, there's like a P looking thing. Like, this thing on the left of the pie is weird. I thought that was another pie, but turns out it's not. Um, all these letters uh, that and, and stuff, and the Greek letters kind of the Greek scholars kind of review them. They have a committee, they vote, you know, all these things, and then they say, okay, we think it's this. Um, and then that was kind of the criteria for the prize, which was cool. But uh, there's a grand prize. So this first letter's prize is ten letters next to each other. The grand prize is four paragraphs, basically, four continuous strings of 140 characters. Uh, and then the each each of the four strings have to have like eighty five percent character recognition, which is pretty darn good. Um, so uh, yeah, and uh, I've just been working on that. Uh, there's another sub, uh, contestant who also submitted another image, uh, and he he kind of submitted a few weeks after me, and he basically used uh, a very similar approach. Um, and I'll probably team up with him, uh, which is cool uh, for the grand prize. Um, but uh, yeah, just kind of working toward the grand prize is what I've been doing, and uh, just kind of traveling, just kind of in the wake of uh, all this, all this kind of uh, news and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of it. You can see the code online here. Uh, you can download this, run it yourself. Uh, there's this submission text which kind of explains how everything works. Um, so here's here's a good example of the training examples. So take that whole letter, you chop it up into tiny bits, uh, and then according to my labels, um, some of these have um, this kind of cracking pattern that I talked about or not. Um, but these, you know, training examples are obviously very small. And you flip it, you rotate it, you, you know, adjust the, like, brightness and contrast and stuff. Um, but this is what the machine learning model sees. And then you just show it every little bit of the image uh, that you're kind of uh, training on, or that you're doing inference on, excuse me. Uh, and then, yeah, the other interesting thing is for a lot of these letters, you can kind of pick them up visually. This N is especially clear. You can kind of see this like cracking pattern. It goes up and then a little bit down and then up again, um, which is cool. Uh, but others are far more subtle, so like this gamma here uh, or this Y or whatever, or oops a lot, I think is actually the letter. Like you can kind of see it, but not really. But the good thing about this first letter thing is we can, yep. A quick, quick question, like, given how thin all of these slices of paper are, like, when you saw, when you showed us the, the actual 3D, like, image, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. like, what, what's the chance of, of a leakage, like, of, of, like, letters from a different slice being combined with a, with a slice you're looking at and stuff like that? Is there any potential that that, that could happen? Obviously, if you catch a co cohesive, like, a coherent word, then you know it's from a single, highly likely from a single slice, but in general, did you notice? something like that happening maybe yeah uh i i think like that's a huge risk and it happens all the time and this is just an especially clean section which is why it works so well um but in general it's like very messy and like pieces get fused together pieces kind of get lost in that fusing process and then you have to do some rearrangement after the fact uh to help but the scan is multi-layer uh this is the scan on the left here it's multi-layer so if it's fused here it may not be fused you know a few layers below and stuff which is um you know super helpful uh but yeah like there's like weird like not bugs but like holes in the data where like text gets repeated because it like loops around again because the person like forgot to like go out one layer on the spiral because they didn't realize what was going on and stuff um but you're correct that's like a huge risk and like a huge problem but here like it's like a coherent greek word so we know it's like um valid and then you can also like look at the spiral section itself and you're like yeah it's like pretty out there in the open Yeah. So uh, this is the code. You can download it, run it. Just DM me on Twitter if you have any issues. Uh, you don't need crazy hardware for it. Um, you just need like PyTorch and then a GPU, not a fancy GPU. 
uh, the whole thing is like less than 700 lines, which I'm very happy about. It's very, it's relatively simple for what it does. Um, and it like downloads all the data from the like kind of data set server and stuff. Um, but yeah, you can just clone this, run it yourself, um, you know, reproduce those images you saw uh, and uh, have a good time. So yeah, that's about all I have planned. Is there anything else you'd like me to kind of elaborate on or anything? You can go ahead. Okay, so you used ResNet 18. Have you yep. tried after like uh, you like um, obviously succeeded? Just uh, YOLO and uh, scale this up. Mm -hmm. so that's what yeah, so I've been trying to do that. Um, you know, annotation is hard uh, just because it's like a very clunky process, and I've like written tools to like speed it up and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, you kind of bootstrap it up. Model ar architecture is non-trivial. Um, some model t architectures do materially better than others. I don't know why. So, like, I'm going to switch to, like, an Inception V3, uh, which is, like, some other image classifier I don't know a ton about, um, just for, like, the, uh, you know, the outputs. Uh, so that's fun. Um, but, yeah, you just kind of yellow this. You bootstrap it up so you can find a lot more text, and then that's kind of what the grand prize is. I've been working on that. They have like weird NDAs around it, uh, so I can't like show a ton of text. Well, actually, I can show one image. Look up here. Uh, like a lot of text comes out. So this is kind of a newer image. This is from Yusuf, the other guy. Excuse me. Um, but you can see the word purple here, the perforos. Excuse me, that I mentioned. And then there's just a ton of other text uh, around here as well. So. Super doable. Um, I think we're going to be able to read the whole scroll. And I think, you know, there are hundreds of other scrolls that we can read uh, like this as well. So again, I think it's all very in reach. Sorry, by scaling up, I meant uh, just using like a bigger model, like ResNet 50 instead of ResNet mm -hmm. 18. Uh, like, uh, have you tried that? And what version? Yeah, I have. Um, just like the off the shelf PyTorch one, um, like ResNet 50 is like fine. Like, it doesn't do substantially better in these cases and it's kind of like slightly noisier just anecdotally so my intuition is that it's just too many parameters for such like relatively simple patterns because again like resnet like it's supposed to classify like a thousand things and like you know i'm just classifying is this ink yes or no so it's like arguably a simpler problem in that regard um so the smaller models seem to do pretty well and again your data set is really small so having a smaller model helps protect against overfitting as well um but yeah, this, you're, you're, you're asking the right question. Like I've been experimenting with this and I don't know the correct answer. Did you maybe try, like at this point, we're throwing the idea at this point, at, at this problem, uh, like some of the segmentation models and just use the free train features there and like put some type of a classifier on top of it. Like something like that. I'm thinking because you mentioned ResNet being free trained on ImageNet, like the, the distribution shift is significant. Like, so either, fine tuning something that exists or finding something that's pre-training on something that's closer that has a smaller domain shift between what you're trying to do and, and what was the pre-training data, like something along those lines. Did you maybe think about that? I, I thought about it a little bit. So the other contestant, ah, sorry, I dropped my AirPod. Um, the other contestant, Yosef, he did a lot of like pre-training stuff and that was like moderately helpful. But at the end of the day, just kind of creating more labels is the thing that kind of accelerated his results the most. Um, so yeah, there's that. And then, um, I, uh, yeah, I think there's something you can do there with pre-training, like, you know, like the Dino V2 paper, I think is state of the art. Like there's definitely something there that you can apply to this. Um, I was talking to a friend last night, like about this and he works at an AI company and, uh, yeah, he's like, yeah, dude, like you gotta, you gotta pre-train, you know, I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I really should. So, but yeah, yeah, again, that's, that's, uh, that's a great question for sure. Awesome. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Maybe something of a, of a, a silly question or a crazy question, but because I think uh, in this problem, it's mostly about the data engineering part than the model probably, right? Because you yeah. want to like keep boost, bootstrapping it. Uh, mm -hmm. do, you think, do you think it would be possible? Maybe it's a totally crazy idea to like take an existing manuscript and burn that and create a data set out of that, like uh, beforehand, and then try to transport it to the problem. 
Yeah, so I've actually tried that myself where I burned, like I bought a bunch of papyrus on Amazon. I burned it. I CT scanned it at my local university. And the answer is that the intrinsics of the CT scan are different for each like environment, right? And because of that, it's not an easy one-to-one -one transfer. You can do things to transfer it, um, but if you like train on like one scroll and try it on another, it doesn't work. And I don't know why. I don't think anyone knows why. You can do obvious things like, you know, do like linear transformations on the data to make their normal distributions match. It still doesn't work. You know, you can make the brightness contrast the same. We're just not sure why that doesn't work. Obviously it should, right? Because there are some cases where if you like scan physical objects next to each other, like in the same scanning session, basically, and then you're like train it on two and then try it on the third, it works. But if you do like, you know, this like rinky dink scroll that Luke scanned at his university and compare it to the particle accelerator scan of this like super old scroll, um, it doesn't transfer super well, at least not yet. But you're correct, mm. like visually under the scan, um, they look similar. So there should be a way to like fudge the data and, and make it work. But I don't know, we're just not there yet. If you if you have ideas, like I'm, I'm all ears, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to figure this out. I've been trying to figure it out. Mm, maybe, yeah, maybe some, some kind of style transfer technique or something, I don't know, but uh, cool. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I like that you actually tried to burn it and <laughs> scan it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Is any of these synthetic data public? Like, uh, your... So all of, um, first of all, all the CT scans are public. You have to like fill out an NDA form, but that's it. You just go to scrollprize.org or just Google like scrolls challenge and this will come up and you can just download it all yourself. Oh. And then every, all the code to produce the images I showed you is also open source. So my training labels are up there. You can download those and everything. So yeah, it's, it's all open source. You're welcome to play with it. I'm not asking about uh, scro uh, Herculean scrolls. I'm asking about uh, synthetic scrolls that you tried to burn and uh, scan. Uh, is any like uh, of uh, like results of such approaches? Like uh, I've seen other people trying this uh, on Discord. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, like ha is uh, has any uh, one published this data? So uh, there's another contestant, uh, like his name's Wayne Wayne Hello on Discord. He's published a bunch. Uh, I haven't like talked a ton about the stuff I've tried just because it hasn't really worked. And, you know, I, I haven't like, you know, I didn't want to like take the time to like put it in the same like data format as the other scrolls and like the volume cartographer stuff. Um, but like, yeah, so like I, I can like send you the scans I have if you want. Like you can just, like, I can put them on the Discord server or something like that. But um, honestly, I'm not sure they're like super useful at this point. Um, I think the most important thing is just making more training labels from the from the school. But like, we need to figure this out. And the crazy thing is like, uh, this is kind of tangential, but like, again, there are hundreds of scrolls that we can read and that we need to scan. And we can't fly them one at a time to Britain on this like super tight schedule with their particle accelerator. Like someone has to figure out how to make a better CT scanner that they can keep in Italy and then just kind of walk it over from the museum. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done in this, like scanning, domain transfer, all these things. I mean, I'm I'm purely fascinated by the by the scan you showed me. Like that, that piece of technology was actually fundamental. Like, from people who were actually fine, like like it's very it looks like a very collaborative project, as what you described so far. Like like the the, the CD technology that that has created that initial data set is kind of great as well. Maybe yeah, for sure. Um, related to this work, obviously, like what was your what was the feedback you got from from the from the community from maybe companies like if you can disclose anything there of course i've seen on twitter that can explode it net net retweeting it and then everybody retweeting it but uh if you can share maybe a bit more about the about the impressions and feedback you got from people yeah totally so nat has done a really good job publicizing the challenge and like promoting it which means that a lot of people want to see this succeed so when i was like posting my initial results of just detecting like one or two new letters um they were all pretty receptive uh, Matt's a great guy. I just met him for the first time yesterday in person, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, and uh, yeah, like they, they just want to read the scrolls is their motto. Like we just want to read the scrolls is kind of what they say. Um, and then, yeah, like when the, the first letter stuff went public, there were a few press releases and it got picked up in a bunch of news articles, which was, I think, uh, super, super cool in my opinion. So I'm um, just very lucky and grateful to like be part of the challenge and like, kind of be at this inflection point where you know, I get to get to kind of get some attention, you know, so.
How yeah. often do you think about the Roman Empire? <laughs> That's the next question. All day, every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Super cool. And like, did, did you maybe get any job offers, or was it mostly on the like congratulations and stuff? Super curious um, whether something like that happens. Yeah, yeah, no. So tons of people have been like super like, hey, like if you want to come work with me, like let me know and stuff. Um, I don't know what exactly I'm gonna like do, but like I'm definitely evaluating a few of those options. Um, a bunch of like really cool VC firms have reached out, and it's like, oh man, like I could work here and like learn about startups and then like find my own startup, you know. So um, we'll see. And the other thing, the other variable is like I'm like still in college, and I've been like away from college for two weeks just to like travel for this and come to SF and stuff. Um, so I'll probably drop out of college soon and then take one of those job offers and like work on these scrolls full time in the meantime and stuff. Um, so it's, it's really been a life changing experience, both financially and just like socially, just like, you know, getting to be part of this and like, you know, all the, all the attention it's gotten. And I get to like talk to you guys and stuff, right. Which wouldn't have happened otherwise. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really special. I'm very lucky. I think that's so beautiful about, about the, the time we'll live in, like you can just have somebody sets this up a couple of years ago and then like all that like culminates and the dots connect and we end up here like i think it's super super fascinating yeah thank you yeah yeah i i completely agree it's really cool awesome guys do you have any any questions for luke if not i have i have more okay i have the last one so do i understand correctly that uh, the main difference between you and uh, other uh, like um guy who submitted is mm -hmm. um, that uh, he has more labels yes so he has more labels and he has a different model architecture he, he uses an inception net uh and then he just like i'm not sure he had more labels for his first letter submission but like those are kind of the two differentiating factors. Nothing else really seems to matter other than like having some like reasonable, like not stupid model architecture, and then having like good labels. Like that's it. And like the the labeling process is challenging because like you'll often get letters which are like half formed, and you're like, man, is this a delta or is this like something else? You know, and you like fill it in. And then the model gets a little worse, and you're like, oh crap! And then you have to like undo it and stuff. Um, but that kind of labeling, like guessing, like, you know, annotating processes is, is very tedious and lots of like stops and turns. Do you guys actually share those labels with each other or you just keep them to yourself while, while the competition is on? So the, the labels for these first letters have been open sourced. Um, the labels for the grand prize right now we're competing. We want to team up and we're gonna like call in an hour to talk about that and like sign a piece of paper, you know? Um, and then we'll team up and then, you know, like split the prize money and we're like, you know, very, you know, our chances are very good because, you know, we were only competing with each other, uh, at least as far as I know, there might be someone else. Uh, so again, we'll see, it's not set in stone, but, um, I'm very optimistic and I think a partnership would be very wise. So, yeah. Makes sense. I have a yeah, question sure. that's tangential, like to, to this topic in a way, um, you, you mentioned you, you were an intern at SpaceX. Like, yes. I'm curious, briefly, experiences at SpaceX, like how hardcore is the culture and like how did you, how was, how was your time there? Yeah, it's it's an incredible company. I, I really enjoyed it and was very lucky to be there. So all the rumors are true. It's a very, very hardcore culture, but it's not as bad as it sounds because everyone enjoys their work and everyone believes in what they're doing. If they didn't, have those two things then they would go get a higher paying job somewhere else um yeah and i was down at starbase where they're building their starship rocket and then they launched it in april and i got to see that which was really cool um lots of like little things i learned like you know the intricacies of like how like certain types of valves work or whatever because i was on launchpad software so all just like launchpad stuff for me um the biggest lesson i learned is like just that there's no secret sauce there. It's just a lot of people who are very gritty, working very hard. There's no, there's no like magical incantations they're saying in the back, in the back that like make them move faster. It's just working very, very hard for a very long time by a large number of people. And that's how you get like SpaceX level results and SpaceX level dominance. So obviously, you know, I kind of knew that even before I worked at the company, but like going in there and like seeing it and being like, wow, like, there's no secret here. Like, it's just, you got to work hard. Uh, I think was a very valuable lesson to learn. 
So, and what was your project exactly? Um, Launchpad software. So it was my job, like, hey, Luke, like, here's a valve. Like, decide when the valve should open and close. Go talk to, like, these five people about what they think the valve should do and then get some compromise between all five of them and then program that in. And then that's part of the, like, launch sequence, basically. Um, Because, like, the launch is, like, mostly automated where you, like, turn on the pump, wait till, like, this tank fills up, and then you turn it off, and then you turn this thing on, you know? So there's this, like, long, super complicated sequence to, like, fuel up and launch the rocket. And then, you know, I had, like, these, like, tiny little sections in it, both in code and in, like, writing, which was cool. Crazy stuff. And, like, security-wise, like, even you, you were an intern, like, who, who will not see the, the, the basically, the, the repercussions of your actions while you were there? Like, how do they make sure that the security of your software is, like, good enough before integrating into the platform software? I guess that's the question. Yeah, so for like, uh, they do a very good job with security. So of course, all the like actual like work you do is, you know, the pull requests are reviewed, all these things like, you know, and the code you write has to make sense to others and stuff because other people are familiar with the system too. Um, the security as in like, you know, prevent information leakage or prevent people from stealing, I think is also really strong. Like they just have a really good security like culture and really good like security team. Um, you know, and they've got like these like, you know, giant armed guards who are super nice, you know, everywhere and they'll tackle you if you walk into the wrong building and don't have your badge and stuff. Um, but, you know, again, like I, it's not too different from any other company. I think they do a really good job with security. Nice. And connecting these two topics, like machine learning, um, like that SpaceX actually deploys, if you can reveal something like that. Um, what, what do you mean? Like SpaceX doesn't I mean, do a ton of machine learning. Yeah. But is there, is there any, is like, is, I guess the whole software is just super, super robust and, and like probably even the dynamic allocations of memory are not there or stuff like that. Like, so, so, so I would suppose that you don't have a lot of any machine learning, maybe for some of the landing, like I, I would be, I don't know, I would be probably surprised if there wasn't any, anything that at least augments the landing procedure and like observes the, the environment and then helps the landing. But then again, dynamics, like Boston Dynamics, I, like the last time I, I checked, they didn't have any machine learning and all their robots, the spot robots were super impressive as well. So who knows? But just curious. Yeah. Yeah. As, as I don't, I'm not super familiar with the, the landing process for the Falcon rocket. Um, maybe they're doing augmentations there. I'm really not sure. But like, you know, for the right, I was writing control software there and you're right. It's like, it has to be like super repeatable, super reliable. You know, there are all these paradigms, like, you know, no dynamic memory, like, you know, like, you know, certain weird things about how you structure your code. Um, and those were all, you know, strictly enforced, of course, uh, principles similar to those. Um, but yeah, it's very different from machine learning, right? Like machine learning is just like, you know, a large number of matrix multiplications with some math thrown in. And then this is like control software, like where your your for loop has to work every single time, you know. Uh, but they've got like good tooling around that, so you know it it works pretty well. Yeah. Super cool. Even you can go. Uh, how do you even test that? Uh, there are many different ways. Um, you know, this is all pretty industry standard stuff. Like you can simulate parts of it. Obviously, simulating the whole thing is very challenging. Um, you can test on like the actual hardware, right? Like as long as you're not making fire, you can kind of do whatever you want and organize, you know, tests, right? Again, you know, it's super common. Like they did a wet dress rehearsal a few days ago where they fuel up the rocket, pretend they're gonna launch, don't actually turn the thing on and then they unfuel, right? And that tests like a lot of like really important um, systems. Uh, and so there's lots of stuff. And then of course, individual units of code, you know, you can unit test, you can like, um, like integrate with like other forms of testing. You can attach it to telemetry, um, you know, all that stuff. So there's both traditional software processes and then just like, you can just like test it with the real thing, you know, and that keeps your butt covered for the most part. Uh, and mm -hmm. how, like, as far as I understand, you like talk to multiple stakeholders that were interested like uh, in specific properties uh, of like mm -hmm. uh, how specific valve. Um, opens or closes like how uh, like do you uh, how do they like um, document decision making process like it's uh, uh, as far as i understand it's more like uh, about what to do not uh, like how to do it 
Yeah. Um, they have a pretty rigorous like documentation process, right? Um, and you know, like you attach your documentation to like, you know, your pull request and then you can like get blame everything and see why it is the way it is, uh, you know, and stuff. And then, you know, you kind of have to just like get the, like all the stakeholders in the same room and have them duke it out. And, you know, you can kind of nudge them in one direction and, you know, sometimes someone is stubborn, but I mean, you know, you, you know how it goes, right? Uh, that's just kind of part of life. So, yeah. Awesome. Look, this was super inspiring. I really enjoyed it and, and hearing the and hearing the whole story and like you being 21 years old, like that's that's all super cool. Like I think uh, ultimately it really boils down to just being passionate about something and like as you said, hard work, being being like consistent and not giving up, like and just being curious. Because like if you didn't just see this random podcast and and, and you you were like, why not? Let me let me take, tackle this challenge because it seems fun. Like I, I think yeah. a lot of cool cool things can be done by just being like that yeah for sure thank you yeah like thank you for having me this is this has been great like you guys are you know you're a good crowd so you know this is cool thank you awesome <laughs> thanks thanks for coming